he built the philosophy, uh, the culture, the environment, the way the work, what the work on. This is McLaren Performance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the McLaren Performance Podcast, the podcast where I talk to my dad about everything football, performance, psychology, and together we try and provide something useful for those of you listening. Now this week, it's just the two of us and with that we finally get the chance to just get into the football, which is good timing really, because it's all been going on what with the uh, Man City, Liverpool title race, heating up the top four race, becoming a bit more open, and of course Man United within all of that with a glimmer of hope for them, as rumours suggest Eric Ten Hag is likely to make his way in for next season. To discuss that with me today, as always, is my dad. So, Dad, how are you? I'm very good, Josh. Um, first golf game of the year today. Uh, a little bit rusty. Uh, got absolutely soaked, uh, but managed to get round. So, um, it was good to get out. I would say good to get in the fresh air, but it was fresh air, but it was wet. <laughs> how did you score today? Not bad. I, I don't, I, I've not totted it up, but I was doing okay halfway around. And um, it was interesting because we um, I played with uh, two of the kids, you know, from the academy. Yeah, yeah. And I hadn't uh, played for quite a while with them. And it's it's phenomenal to see the improvement of um, of just two of the six I know that we uh, that we do. Um, phenomenal, not just in terms of their technique, uh, the growing up, the power. Uh, the distance they're getting, but uh, the mindset as well, and um, and and the love competition, and um, it it was a competitive afternoon, and it and it was great to see. So um, so yeah, I'm in uh, I'm in good fettle. Um, I just come off the golf course, so you see my my face is all pink, uh, but no, um, and I know coming back, we had a very interesting discussion about obviously what we're going to talk about. Um, in the next hour or so. Yeah, we've accidentally recorded a podcast, but not recorded it in a half an hour conversation beforehand. But I think it leads in quite nicely into everything we're going to talk about anyway. But just to start off with, just with Ten Hag, and if those rumours are true then with Man United, is that a good appointment for them, do you think, if that's the way it's going to go? Um, listen, you know, obviously things have been said and read and and talked about, and and myself included, but... You know, I, last time I saw Eric a few months ago, um, watched him against PSV, actually. Uh, the one five five one, oh, Phenomenal uh, performance. Mm. And I um, had lunch, had, di- had dinner after the game with him. Um, and not been in contact since. So it's been very interesting <laughs> reading all the headlines and, uh, you know, Eric's got the job and he's going. And uh, But I know football, you know football. Um, newspapers rumors. can talk <laughs> rumors, but and and all I've said whenever I've been interviewed about about Eric, you know, I was very fortunate to uh, to have him in my first year as my assistant, and I didn't have a clue about Dutch football, uh, the environment, the culture, uh, and and I met him on the first day, and we were training the next day, and I was just thinking pre-season I've just got the job press conference then I'm going to meet Eric and then we're pre-season training tomorrow so I said to Eric when I met him Eric you know what have you got for tomorrow what have you got lined up Um, let me get into it then we'll have a talk about you know the six-week plan ahead for pre-season and your thoughts and, and my thoughts well he just produced this document folder it was so thick and every day for the next six weeks was documented in that folder. Every minute of every day from staff getting in the morning, uh, meetings, medical meetings, uh, players training, what time they train, uh, who carries the equipment down to the training ground, uh, drinks breaks at this time for three minutes and then back to work, uh, passing drills for 10 minutes, possession for th- 15 minutes, another drinks break, uh, phase of play. And, and, he, and one day he said, and trainer, this is your 20 minutes that you've got. 
<laughs> just to uh, to work on whatever you you want to work on. I said, thanks, Eric. That's good. <laughs> and this was not just for one day, not just for uh, a week. This was Josh for six weeks. It was phenomenal. I've never seen it before and I've never seen it since. And I thought I used to plan and I really did because I had to do the preseason. So I had to plan every day. I never planned it to the detail that he did. And there was no flexibility within that. That's what you did. There were long days, long hours, a lot of uh, technique work, tactical work. But I tell you something, the work was fantastic. What he built at 20 when I went there, because he started off in the academy and he built his way through. So basically that club, he built the philosophy, uh, the culture, the environment, the way the work, what the work on. And that's in every age group. And the detail was absolutely phenomenal. And uh, that's one thing that always stuck in my mind. And it gave me actually a good six weeks in the preseason to buy into, I had to buy into their culture. I had to buy into what, you know, the 20 way. And I bought into that within two or three days. It was exceptional work, not just himself, but all the staff around him. He had total control over the environment, total control over the players. And basically he allowed me to watch and observe and buy into what they were doing, which I did. And, and that continued throughout these preparation for opponents, his preparation in, for games was, yeah, it was. I've not seen it before. I've not seen it since. I think the second thing, first thing was his attention to detail. The second thing was his work ethic. And I always used to pride myself on, on being the first in and the last away, wherever. I could not beat Eric in. And I would have to throw him out of the office so that I would be the last to leave. And it, it became a little competition between us. And <laughs> I could never win. If I thought, right, I'm going to get there at seven o'clock in the morning. He'd be there at five. I said, you, you got something on my alarm or what? Because you seem to be always ahead of me and always in. And at six o'clock, I always used to exercise at the end of the day. So I always used to go for a run down in the gym, six o'clock. And um, he'd still be in his office, typing away, working away, always had a laptop, always the computer, always watching football, the opponent, whatever, in the players, our own team. And I used to say, you can go now, Eric. We're finished. You know, uh, I'm just going for a little run. Oh, I'll wait, Trina. I'll wait. I'll wait. And I think it was a little contest that we used to, uh, to have. So the work ethic, football, um, attention to detail uh, was, and everybody works like that. Everybody has to work like that. You hear about Guardiola, you hear about Cl all the top managers, all managers have to work mm. that hard. And everybody can work hard. Everybody can have a plan. Everyone can prepare. The key thing, what I saw from Eric in that first year and what I've seen him develop at Go Ahead Eagles when he first went into management, he must have learned so much at Bayern Munich's second team with Guardiola there as well. Uh, but also I used to go watch uh, Utrecht play when he came back to Holland and changed systems, bought different players, different way of playing. And then with Ajax, um, he's just adapted and changed. And, you know, he, he's, he's got a philosophy. He's got a way of playing, way of working. It's very detailed, very structured, uh, but it works. And he's not just got one system, which is 4-3-3 three, three, or 3-4-3. Or three, three. He played a 4-4-2 diamond with, with Utrecht. I've seen him do different things with Ajax. Uh, go ahead. They were in the second division playing football, which I didn't think was possible in the second division in Holland. And his strength was on the field, the game, he could read a game and he could adjust and make adjustments. And that's the key because, as I say, everybody can prepare, everybody can work hard, everybody can have a plan. Um, but on Saturday, kickoff, three o'clock, 
that plan goes out the window sometimes. Opponents are different. They change the way of playing. They change the style. And often I used to be, what, what do we do now, Eric? What do we do now, Eric? And that was always, Eric, what do we do now? And Eric would, well, drop the number 10 down to the number six, push the number two a little bit forward, get the centre back to step into midfield and uh, we'll be okay. <laughs> Did that, the game changed just like that. And I always remember he, he one of the famous tactics they used to have if they weren't controlling the game was, uh, you know, Eric, what do we do now? Well, Trainer, we're not controlling the game. So I think we should go man to man. I remember the first time I said, What, man to man? He says, Yeah, 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 man to man all over the field. I said, You're joking, aren't you? You can't leave the centre back man to man and one at the back. Mm, yeah, we, we do. Go on then. And uh, went man to man. He changed the, the system, told the players, players knew exactly what to do, went man to man. Oh, my God, change the game, Josh. I've never seen. Um, and, and that's what he did. He impacted. In the 90, 95 minutes, his tactical nous, his reading of the game, his adjustments were, were second to none. As I say, never seen it. But I, you know, the best was, was Sir Alex when I used to, you know, what we're going to do now, Gaffer? Well, we're just going to put him there and him there and him there. We'll put him on and him on. And it always worked. And I couldn't, and it, it was illogical. As sometimes I used to say to Eric, that's not logical. Doesn't matter. It will work. And the gaffer was the same. Um, that shouldn't work, but it worked. Mm. And Eric had that tactical now. And what he needed to develop and has developed is he's. His work is on the field. He is a top, 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 top coach. Top, top coach. What's he's developed is his leadership. And that's through the experiences that he's had and the toughness that he's had to go through with Ajax at the beginning was, was very difficult because Amsterdamers are Amsterdamers and uh, 20s are Tuckers. They're the farmers. So he had a tough time in the first six months. Came through that. And I've been to see them quite a few times. And they play some of the best football. It's got them working. And um, that run that he had in the in the Champions League, Real Madrid, how to beat Real Madrid like they did comprehensively, was I've never seen before. He's doing it this season, Dortmund, going to Dortmund and winning 4-0. It's never been done. So... He, um, yeah, he, he will, he will, he's got options. I know that he's got options. Uh, he's probably the most sought after coach in, in the modern game that is ready for the next step, and the next step up. Mm. And uh, whether it's Manchester United or whether it's a big team in Germany, Eric's always plotted and planned his progress in terms of from coach uh, to manager and uh, from manager to top manager. Uh, the next move is going to be very important for him. So he will take his time. He will plan meticulously for that. He will want exactly what he wants. That's, that's what the Dutch way is. Very stubborn. Mm. And... Believe you me, if he goes wherever he goes and the players buy in, oh my God, things can really take off. I've seen with, with other teams. So, yeah, that, that's, you know, roughly my uptake on, on, on Eric. Mm. And um, you'll see him and he might stay at Ajax, but I think probably this is the time to move. He's got options. And as I say, I'm, I'm very excited to see wherever he goes, his next step. I think it's really interesting to have that insight to someone. You've had that insight there of someone so kind of early in their career to see where they are now and see what kind of like the roots of that person is and the roots of their work really, which has led to the position that they're in now. And the one thing you always have always said to me is the ability to adapt to a game is so important and to plan for that. 
I think psychologically as well, that's such a big thing is to go to a game and, and be able and you know, go one nil down and plan B, plan C, plan D and change everything. And that seems like such a big part of what he does and a big part of going into jobs as well is not just adapting tactically, but adapting yourself, adapting your character, adapting how you interact with players. If if these rumors are true, if he makes that transition to Man United. The characters of of the Ajax players are different to the characters of the Man United players. The egos are different. We talked about it before. There's a step up with regards to, say, for example, like an Eddie Howe manager in Newcastle and where they are and the difference between that and an Eddie Howe becoming a top four manager or a Premier League winning manager. There's a difference in that. And if this is the case, that's his step up really, isn't it? Is that step up into top top management and the management of top top egos as well absolutely and we've always said it haven't we that that to make the step you've got to win something mm. and and that's for me the key and you know eric's proved that okay he's gone to ajax and he's always got an opportunity he's always going to be one of three teams that is going to be up there and with a chance to win the league mm. um but it isn't just that it's the way he's done it and won the league it's the way he's, you know, won doubles, won the league and the cup and uh, got the Ajax back to to dominate him, which they weren't really doing before he went there. It was a, it was a bit of a mess. So he's he's kind of transitioned and and done that. And I think his next step, you're absolutely right, is is to go from he's, he's a contender now to become a because he is a top, top coach. There will there will be tactically and, and adapting um, to whatever the situation is. It, it, it will always. I remember the first game we were we were winning one nil. First game, and I said uh, they put four subs on. I said, Eric, what are they doing? They said, Well, they're doing like we are. They're going to go man to man. I said, Man to man. They're going to go man to man. He said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going to go man to man. So they're going to put two up front against our two centre-backs, two against our full-backs, two in midfield. They're going to leave one-on-one one at the back and they're going to go man-to-man in midfield. And I said, and what do we do? He said, well, we can do two things. We can be defensive and put a, a third defender on. So we've got the extra man at the back. But he said, if you do that, they'll just put another man against him. Um, or we can put another striker on. And then we have to score the second goal. And I said, hmm, okay. And I was quite a defensive-minded coach then. I said, we'll put another defender on. Put another defender on, went three at the back. We conceded a last-minute goal, (laughs) 1-1. And that, that that cemented our relationship. And also my trust in him from the first game, I thought, well, I'm going to listen to this guy from now on. So mm-hmm. he's adapted and wherever he goes, he, he will adapt because he's got that football brain knowledge and he just studies the game 24-7. Yeah. That seems like, that seems the impression I get. It's such a great understanding of the game, obviously. But then his communication to you, that kind of simplicity and that communication of, right, you've got two options could do this you could do this and how how such a good coach really does that and i think from your from yourself as well uh, that kind of delegation and and relying on your coach like that so much is our thing for for someone to do in a management position to refer to their assistant so much but that's what makes for sometimes such great managers is to utilize the staff that they have around them but yeah in terms of ten Hag, it's it all sounds exciting with regards to his career whether that's man united or not i think just in contrast to that a situation with Man United. We just watched uh, we watched Liverpool Man City uh, on Sunday, and that was such an interesting game. Really, the the peak of the Premier League at the moment, the peak of football in general. I I, I was watching it, and I I was just kind of in awe of the game itself. Not so much the detail, the tactical aspect of it, but the the kind of toe to toe real. Players performing it almost like ninety nine percent. Really, the goals coming from minute mistakes that you could really even call mistakes. It was kind of just in the moment. That's what happened, and then you go one end, you go the other end, and it was two teams really just for me. Two teams really at their peak with management, their peak with staff, their peak with clubs 
really at their peak as well. And a really interesting game to watch. What were your thoughts just on the game in general, the thoughts also kind of tactically, I guess the aspects that I don't really understand, but how were both teams playing? How were they set up? Why did it make for such a good game? Um, you always knew, I think, um, uh, Jamie Carragher and, and, and Gary Neville kind of talked about the game and saying this will this will be the showpiece of world football. There mm-hmm. will be no better two better teams than these two teams in world football. And you can normally get one dominating in a country like Bayern Munich, like this year, Real Madrid. And, and before it's been Real Madrid, Barcelona, where then you could go, this is a top, top game. Um, you know, in the Premier League, you've not got one dominating, you've got two. So when they clash and come together, you expect something special. And we expected that before the game. <laughs> we got it during the game and it was exceptional. And for me, what, what we do a lot with, uh, with FIFA um, in terms of the technical department is we look at a lot of, of uh, current trends. So we, we look at um, past trends. So we look at past World Cups, Euros, Champions Leagues, whatever. And we see how they've developed and changed um, year in, year out in terms of tournaments. And so we look at the past to, uh, and then kind of say, well, what's current? What's the current trend? So how has it changed from, say, four or five years ago? And basically trying to read, well, what is the future trend? What are we seeing that will be developed or needs to be developed? And that game brought out everything that was classic about football in the past, present, and what will happen in the future. Two teams who, they're changing the role of the goalkeeper completely. The goalkeeper is an outfield player. He he joins in, he's part of the team, he's the main man in the build-up. He starts off attacks. And you see with both of the goalkeepers, they can hit 60, 70 yard passes. So opponents may squeeze and press, like Liverpool like to do, also Man City like to do. But you're always vulnerable when you do that because you leave one on one at the back. And the key was that you, uh, the goalkeepers could, could, with one pass, eliminate the whole team and create an opportunity by putting the ball behind uh, the defensive line of either team and with the speed in both teams. Defences are vulnerable. So goalkeeping role is changing. It will develop. Uh, one of my questions is, uh, would be to the to one of the top coaches, would be how how far does a goalkeeper now can go or will go to become part of the team? So at the present moment, they are about 30, 35 yards. They can be out of their goal with the ball at their feet and be able to play passes that the top passes in midfield can play. They can play through the lines. They can switch the play. They can play diagonals and they can play one ball over the top. So it's one hell of a weapon. Um, the second thing is the role of the fullback. That's been changing um, for a few years now, but I think they're taking it to a different level, um, especially Liverpool, because I think Man City with Walker do have that threat, but Walker, wow, he's he kind of plays more of a, a three at the back with Man City, so that their rest defence teams can't counter attack against them because they've got three defenders and always uh, Rodri in front, so three plus one. But Liverpool just go all out. Robertson left wing, uh, Alexander Arnold right wing. And I think the role of the fullback epitomised with uh, Liverpool's equaliser, Robertson crosses, uh, Trent pulls the ball back, 
from the far post, from the byline, and Jota scores. One fullback to the other. So the role of the fullback is changing and they're becoming much more uh, attacking players. And that's overlapping and underlapping. So I think that will develop even further. So fullbacks will uh, become quicker, stronger, be able to do more of them runs. They have to be uh, one of the best passers in, in the club. They have to be one of the best crossers in the club. And so whereas fullbacks previously just relied on playing from back to front, they'll have to adapt a lot. Uh, Centre-backs, in, in fact, the bat line, and this was the, the major factor for me, seeing the two defences so high and to play at the intensity that they have to play at, to win the ball back within five to eight seconds, which both teams like to do, they have to be compact. So the middle of the park is normally 30 by 25, 40 by 30 maximum. So playing through the middle, two things. One, you need to be so good technically, receiving the ball, able to turn, know what's behind you, that there's no space in that middle, no space whatsoever between the lines to play through. And players have to be so technically, technically very good. So where is the space? The space is in the wide areas, which the fullbacks are occupying, and the space is behind the back fours. And what's happening, and you saw it, there was a surprise with Man City when they played Jesus on the right, and they expected Grealish or somebody else to play, uh, Mares. But what Jesus gave you, Sterling gave you, and Foden gave you was exactly what Liverpool's front three, Jota, Salah and Mane gave you. They just make, and you look at the stats, twice as many runs forward, penetrating behind back fours than any other team in the Premier League. Yeah. And, and, and what it was, both back fours, and this is where the centre-backs are going to change, is centre-backs now must be able to defend one-on-one. -on -one. And you saw that perfectly. If your mm. defenders are not quick, can't defend one-on-one, -on -one, you will lose against Man City and Liverpool. You will concede goals. Now, Liverpool, Man City, uh, Man City have Walker, uh, Stones, there's no slouch. Uh, Liverpool have Matip, who's no slouch. Van Dijk, who's phenomenal. And it's risk and reward. And I'm thinking, oh my word, they are so vulnerable to the ball through from the back, behind their back. Mm. Yes, the goalkeeper has to be the sweeper keeper and he has to cover the central defenders, but it's such a risk. And I call it risk and reward. And they know that they must stay compact. If they get stretched, they'll get played through behind the lines or through, and then the ball will be played behind the lines. Mm. So it's risk and reward. So you saw so many, it would be great to get the analysis and the count of how many times the front players penetrated behind the back players. And you have a look at the amount of balls that were played diagonally or in behind the defenders. So hardly ever through, hardly ever through. That's the major factor in the game. That will only develop and every team will develop that. Liverpool, mm. Man City are the masters of it. And when you've got Van Dijk and you've got Walker, who many, many times, how many times you see players going through and they were inches just offside. That's what I was going to say. The, 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 I think it was goals conceded at both ends were both two goals that were just like marginally onside, offside. And I think like Liverpool's goal was Salah's ball in and that was just a real marginal, like just marginally like defending, maybe letting the runner, like losing his runner a little bit. And on the other end as well, it was similar. And that's, that was what the, I think Sterling's goal disallowed towards the end as well. 
it was uh, offside. Only marginally with VAR, it was literally like his nose sticking out or something. It is literally that was that's what I was thinking when you were talking there. A lot of the attack was that, and that's what was exciting about it was those those fantastic runs and those fantastic passes being made. You right from from the wide players, and and that's really the, and nothing really happening in the middle. Nobody going through the middle, but. Create the creativity around the outside, and maybe that's where the future is: is, is creativity and in, in those outside players and, and things being made in the outside. You know, you know what the the the, the main thing mm. about what the future will be, and what Klopp and and Guardiola have developed, mm. the, and developed in their teams is courage. Mm. Is is courage? It's courage for the goalkeeper to be thirty yards from goal and to play passes between the lines, switch yeah. the play, play over. That takes courage to do that. Courage to hold that higher line, knowing you're susceptible to runs being through, knowing that you're inches from being right and being wrong. That takes courage. And courage to, to everybody commit to winning that ball back in, yes. in five to eight seconds. That takes courage. To courage to keep possession of the ball and play in tight areas mm. and to, to bring opponents on. That takes courage. And that's what I experienced in, in Holland and in, in my philosophy, bringing back that it's, it's so easy. Everybody wants you to play. Everybody wants you to play. And it is a risk and reward. And it is that courage to say, no, we're just going to keep playing like this. Mm. I remember when I came back in, in, from Holland and I came back to Derby and wanted to play that way. And, and sometimes if the opponent pressed, we'd turn our backs and walk away. And I went, no, 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 no. You know, we had the courage and conviction to say, no, get back. Goalkeeper, play it there. Don't just play it long, play it back. And I've also lost my courage in terms of sometimes going and going, you know, Newcastle, a good example, and saying, oh, I'm not too sure if we can actually play out of this press. So, so play along. Yeah. What these two have got is just sheer courage. Liverpool courage to not so much have possession of the ball, but the courage to go win it and gamble and risk a high line and everybody press and win it from various areas and then counter-attack. Man City, the courage that it takes to build up and keep possession of the ball, you don't, you know, unless you coach, unless you coach that way, unless you've been through that system, that takes the biggest courage. And that's what they've got, that mm. conviction, that commitment, that belief and that courage. And they, you've often said it, uh, uh, heard it being said in that Amazon uh, documentary that they did with Guardiola, I'm trying to give you the courage, players, to play. Yeah, Giving you the courage to play. Go and play. Mm. And I thought that was so... Pro and that's the biggest difference, that in pressure situations, when you're being pressed, uh, when you're at the bottom of the league when you're just going for the top four positions and you need to win this game and it might be a draw, stick to your convictions. Mm. Otherwise, you're caught between the devil and the deep blue sea and them two teams are not. They went at it, hammer and tong, hammer and tong, all mm. the time. And it, I think the last thing which you should be able to comment on, we talked about it and debated it, mm. is... How do you get that behaviour in the players? Because these are elite players who want to win, who are the top five, 10 percent in the world. Mm. And how do you get them from 20 years ago when they used to fight in the tunnel before they're going out mm. to shaking hands, cuddling each other, asking how everybody is, where are you going for dinner tonight? Go out onto the field for 90 minutes. Uh, still put the tackles in and the will to win, but then afterwards show the respect and cuddle and talk to each other. That would never happen 20 years ago. So that also, and also the respect that the two managers have for each other. You imagine 
Ferguson and Wenger doing that 20 mm. years ago. Mourinho doing that 20 years ago. And you've still got that with Simeone, that kind of mentality. But I think managers are changing. And I think football and society has changed the game. Mm. And I think you saw that demonstrated Man City against Liverpool. Well, you just discussed there, really, the future of the, the tactical, the technical, I think you kind of summarising what you said, it's kind of the embrace of total football, really, isn't it? And, and even more so than it has been before. And that's the real te- the tactical aspect. But with the psychological, you're right, there's a change, really, from what the what has been, say, 20 or 10 years ago, because there's discussion in the media with regards to uh, is this rivalry of of Liverpool, Man City, is it the same kind of rivalry? Is it is it just as good or better than what Man United and Arsenal had? And, and another, you know, Real Madrid, Barcelona, these kind of things. And and the difference really is with the Liverpool City game, you could kind of see almost like within the game itself, within the decisions, a real less of emotion driven, very logically driven, very like tactical like we're talking about there it's, it's very different compared to before where it's your Roy Keane it's your anger it's going to the refs it's going to everyone else it's it's drama it's, it's fights and we're talking about that and we talked about it before where that's kind of changing and, and why that's changing and well I think it's the development of if the, well the football's better objectively the football is better than what it was 20 10 years ago this is really Looking at that game to me was like, wow, this is really the peak of what football is at the moment. And really it will get better from there as well. And a part of how it's got better, I think, is this losing, which I talked about before, it's interesting. It's, there's no real, real answer to it. It's almost like less masculinity in the game, less aggression. It's more, I look at it and say it's more procedural, it's more process. We're talking about before, you were saying before, you know, at Man United, there'd be fights, people shouting at each other. That's not good enough play. You know, managers going to play like, what are you doing? Like, you need to be doing this. And that is just not in the best way. It's not in the game anymore. I find it's better to go to players. And it's something that I try to do it and do do it at the women's team at Newcastle. And what I do really with the golf and everything is it's all very uh, grounded. It's, analysis is discussion amongst players what did you do right what did you do wrong right what do we need to do in the next game a win it's very not emotional at all it's very logical it's very process driven of what do we need to improve on and for me the that man city liverpool game is a is kind of a result of the past few years of being just that and the 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 kind of the moving away from the aggression, from the fighting, and that kind of being a distraction from what the real process is, is improving all the time. And you're talking about Pep Guardiola and we're talking about Klopp and how they have this real great balance. Of the, they have the respect of the players and they can challenge them and they can, you know, say, why are you not doing this? And they and you see Pep on the side, like, you go, oh, go to Sterling, I really go into him. But there's a mix there in his body language of he's angry with him for not doing the thing, but there's also excitement in his body language in like, if he did do that thing he wanted him to do, that'd be amazing. You're going to be such a good player if you do that. And there's this real balance now. There's no fear anymore. No pure fear of, oh, you got to do no rolling with an iron rod or whatever you call it. It's very balanced. It's comforting, but it's realistic at the same time. It's protecting. It's Klopp giving everyone a hug and making everyone happy and smiling mixed with him gritting his teeth on the sideline as well and telling them what they need to do. I think the future is, and what it is now at the very best, is a mix of that aggression, that fighting, and that caring, that compassion. And in between that, uh, a lack of emotion, very procedural, very simplistic. What are we improving all the time? What do we need to do now to win the next game? And you can kind of see that. That game was no, really, it wasn't no fights, Nobody kicked off of anyone, but it was we just the excitement for me of the game came from the absolute the the pure ability that the players were showing. They were playing at their best, and that came from being level headed. That came from a, the source of psychology. 
So, yeah, I think all of that within that made that game fantastic and and what is going to go towards the future of football, really. I think during the game, Josh, the some of the tackles, the, the, the high challenges, um, some of them were, were bordering on, on straight red cards. Mm-mm. So they're not losing that. They're not losing that will fight great determination to win. I think the, it's kind of the word macho has been taken out of the game. Mm. Uh, badge of honor uh, oh, don't talk to the opponent um, and 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 just have a you know you'd never see Keenan Vieira you know doing that mm. before after the game and it was kind of in them days not to show that it's to be macho it's to be mm. a man is not to show his emotion. But isn't isn't there ignorance in that? You know, there's, to me, and that's what we're talking about with our generational difference, really, is is our generation is looked at as soft. And it kind of, a lot of ways, it is, it's like ch- trying to say these things aren't within our control, or whatever, you know, th- you know, it's everybody else's fault. It's kind of that mentality within our generation. But I think there's an in-between where there's an understanding. I just remember that, uh, Wayne Rooney documentary, uh, the incident at the World Cup where he got sent off and, and he, you know, he'd done something stupid and in that aggression in that moment. And to this day, he's saying, you know, I don't know why I did it. And that really infuriates me when a player will say, I don't know why. And I'll say, you need to know why. You need yeah. to know why you think like that. You need to know yeah. why you feel like that because yeah. that informs your actions. And the problem with psychology at the moment and implementing it is it's it's associated with being soft. It's associated with feelings and opening up, and it, it's a lot of insecurity really in in men in masculinity in football, and that's why it's so difficult. But that's the future, because I think that's kind of what you see in the Man City and the Liverpool is an environment where people feel safe. Call it being psychological psychological safety. The the environments there are so good, and the managers care obviously for the players. So they feel like, and that's what you just said with Pep Guardiola, like he wants them to have courage to play. And that's exactly what he's let them do. And that's why they play so well, because they're psychologically safe in the moment and they can express themselves. They're not run by fear or insecurity, not hot-headed. They're making challenges, like you said, but you can also almost imagine that they're logical choices that they're making to make those kind of challenges to gain an advantage in the game in certain ways. So it's all logical. It's all grounded and it all comes from an understanding. And it, I don't think either Liverpool or Man City say have a sports psychologist. I don't necessarily think the future of football is that there will be a sports psychologist within a uh, coaching staff or something like that. I think the future is more that coaches will have a greater understanding of sports psychology. They'll have a greater understanding of how an environment feeds into the the psychological safety of an environment, the communication within it, the hierarchy within it feeds into the, the minds of the players and the coaches and how they feel and how they act from that in games and from that, how that then feeds into results. I think coaches will just gain a better understanding of that in the future and that will be a part of it, not so much that there'll be sports psychologists within it. But that's why I, I like the game. The game was so good because it reflected the future of that for me. And you could see that it was perfect, you know, technical, tactical, psychological, whatever. It was almost like every aspect of that was covered within that game. But you're right. There's, I want to touch on it in the next week. I'm going, to, I'm going to do a bonus episode. and It's kind of like this change in football for the better almost. Uh, it definitely is for the better is the the neutralizing really of football the not it's not the old working class game it was before with the insecurity and aggression of men that was within it it's kind of changing into something more neutral which objectively is bringing out better performances as we've seen in that game i think josh 
just talking like that and then reflecting on what we talked about this afternoon as well, in terms of what do we call this, this new society, shall we call it? You know, from my day and, and, and you know, with the gaffer, Sir Alex, with Jim Smith, um, you know, Brian Horton, um, you know, very much macho. The dressing room was macho. Don't sh- show any sign of weakness. Man up. You can't say that now, but man up. Get on with it. Toughen up. Mm. That was it. And we had one emotion. We had one emotion that we had to toughen up. We had to take the, the criticism. We had to take the, the hits. And mm. we had to play through fear. Fear of, of reprisals. Fear of criticism. Fear of your fault. Fear of that. And and it, it, it was a, a match. And I was just to say, you know, when going to Manchester United, what, what's it like? Oh, it, it's so competitive. It's so macho. It's so testosterone. It's every day is, is you, you could have fights on the field. You could have this, you could have that. It, it was, it was unbelievable. And then, and then all of a sudden, I thought, I can't remember when the book came out, but remember Bill Bezik giving me a book. Um, and also I think Steve Round as well. Uh, the two of them kept me a book and said, Read that. That's the future. And it was called Emotional Intelligence. Yeah. Daniel Goldman. Yeah. And and I couldn't get through it then. What? Emotional intelligence. What? Empathy. What? Mm. You know, what what they think. No. We tell them what to do. And if they don't do it, we tell them quite forcefully what they're not doing. Yeah. So it's very much a yell. Mm. No, do this, do that, do the other. Feedback, criticism, instant, honesty, brutal honesty. There was no empathy. And this emotional intelligence book is all about that. Mm. And and I went five, six years ago, when go, I went, no, you will never get away from that. You, you, that you, you're empathy. You're not, you're not talking honestly. And I think that is the difference. That's the common denominator now. You have to, in a high-performing environment, culture, at the very, very top, or even wherever you are in sport, you cannot lose honesty. You Mm. cannot lose it. What we've learned with emotional intelligence is how to deliver that criticism, that honesty, and not like we used to, yeah, bump, 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 hair dryer, bump, pin them yeah. up against the wall, bump, show them a video. We used to go back and look at a video for 90 minutes. Mm. Over 90 minutes, and we used to dread it. And you used to know, oh, no, I'm going to make a mistake here. And then it'd be, McLaren, what the, were you doing in that situation? What What were you thinking about, you absolute idiot? You, yeah. you will never be in the team again if you keep doing it. And now, now it's... Idiot. Now it's they'll show you the footage and they'll say, right, what did you do wrong here? Why did this happen? Explain this. Yeah. And like you kind of said there, like the message used to be toughen up, do this. But as you and I know, that's bad coaching because it you don't understand the player and you're not really getting through to them and getting them what you want to do. If you want to get players to do what you want them to do, you have to get to know them. And you have to earn their respect. And especially these days, you have to communicate to them properly with respect and with care. And like you said, with honesty as well, because with all this conversation and with it, with things, changes happening, there is a threat of yeah being too soft and not being honest with players. And I'm massively against that. You've got to tell, you've got to be realistic. That's the key. There's this scale of, negativity and, and too much positivity and I think there's a middle ground of just realistic what did you do right what did you do wrong and and we talked about it before in terms of the development of players and and how to you know develop top athletes and it really is in my mind I think recruiting these players that have this attitude and I think that attitude is and it's something you can't teach is players people have this really strong desire to want to do something or win something and the belief that they can do it kind of balanced with this insecurity in themselves that they can't do it. And it is this 
that that thing together kind of drives them forward. So, right, you've got that player with that drive. And then you put them in situations that are challenging. This isn't the, this is the not soft bit. This is the tough bit where you put them in those situations and you challenge them and they have to go and figure it out and they have to go and lose. And then you know, they lose and you have to say, this is why you lost because you didn't do this or you did this. And that's the support part is when they need it, you come in and support and you help them. All that realistic criticism, all with the, like Pep being excited, all with that criticism being, but you're going to be great if you do this because I want you to be great and I want you to win games for you. And it's this balance. It's not, it, that's the future. And it's the problem is that it's seen as soft, but really it's this balance of realistic realistic criticism and improvement and process. I think we we come full, full circle mm. um, because it just reminds me of, of going to Holland and, and working with Eric, especially that first season. And himself, all the coaches had a laptop and they carried that laptop with them around the training ground, in the corridors, in the canteen, Uh, on the team bus, in the hotel away from home. And what they used to do, they used to collect clips of of the players. So the analysts used to collect clips of the players, good and bad, and used to put them together. And you used to see uh, the coaches regularly. They finished training. That wasn't the work done. That was just the beginning. Mm. So sometimes we'd film training and they'd have clips from that and they'd be pulling a player. And every every coach, they believed a lot in, in, in player development, individual player development programs, plans. And part of that was giving them feedback in training, feedback on games. And Eric used to regularly, and he insisted on all the staff doing it, pull in a player, Okay, let's look over your last three games. And he'd have the clips and he'd sit there for 20 minutes, half an hour, talking the player through, as you quite rightly say, want to make you better, son. You can do this. That was a bit disappointing. And it's, it's the different way of delivering feedback. But it was brutally honest. In our day, 20 years ago, 15, we didn't have that real video. We'd have to watch it for 90 minutes to go through it and everything. Now it's instant. You can break up a player. And it was teaching. It was coaching. And that I I really took on board. And whenever, you know, I've worked back in England, coaches, you finish your training, get the laptops out, meet a player in the canteen, meet him in the corridor, pull him into your office and deliver, deliver not criticism, but make them reflection. better players. Yeah, it's reflection. reflection. That's why I call it. What, and he used to do that. And I used to think that was absolutely, wow, marvellous. And, and it's come full circle where we used to teach everything. Now we need to teach the player to teach himself Exactly. everything and we're just the guides and that's so i what, think mm. you know i think full that comes full circle from where we started with eric Absolutely. and what he developed at 20 to actual what's happening in the game and emotional intelligence all top coaches must have and it's yeah. delivering it at the right time in the right manner to the right person in the right environment right place mm. but the right messages yeah, and I think in addition to that as well, it's as well like it's collaboration of players as well. Because what I like is those meetings and asking players, and then players talking themselves and talking about the team and saying what could be done, and and having that collaboration and communication within meetings, which then you know it's it's giving the the players. That's what we kind of do now with this generation is give the players more ownership, or at least give them the illusion of ownership of their performances and the team's performance. And allow them to make choices themselves. I think that's a big part of it. And a big part of that reflection is giving them the process. I think we had a perfect example of it a few weeks ago. We had Paul Simpson on the podcast. Mm. And we were kind of saying to him, you know, what 
what you're going to, you know, how are you going to be different? And, and you know, two things stick in our minds, isn't it? It's not about me. It's about them. It's exactly. about them being better. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and what you're going to, how are you going to handle the players? And he talked about his first game and he came in at half time. And before he even spoke to the players, he asked the players, what do you think? What are the problems out there? How do you feel? What's it? And he said, yeah, the players came back. We got a problem down the right hand side. And we did, well, how are you going to solve that? What do you think? Well, I think he should be, but he, and he said, right, that's great. We'll do that. And I went, wow, that is great coaching. Yeah. In the heat of the moment, in the heat of the battle, you've only got 15 minutes. In the past, we had 15 minutes and we hammered them for 15 minutes. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. We've got to change this. We've got to change that. We've got to change the other. We've got to change. Now get out and do it. Mm. Now, with Simo's example, all of a sudden we're putting that emphasis and onus on the players to solve it, the situation. And we are there to guide them, to help them to become better players and eventually a better team. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you, Dad, for another interesting discussion. It was good just to talk about football this week and just have a discussion between ourselves. I think about a really interesting game in, in Man City versus Liverpool and really within watching that game, kind of seeing what the future of football is going to be in the tactical sense, seeing, I think, a great embrace of, of total football and a great embrace of some unbelievable tactics these days, but the, the psychology of it and the lack of, of the Roy Keane's in players these days we say I remember seeing Kevin De Bruyne at the end of the game saying that you know he was talking to Van Dyke because his kids go at the same school and I think just a real professional standard that has no sacrifice on the quality of the game or the intensity of the game and as we can see football is just getting better and better with the I think the embrace of psychology really the embrace of good process the embrace of reflection and good coaching that is different, very, very different from the aggression and the fight and the mess really of what football used to be, which made for great entertainment. But now it seems that football is entertaining in a different way, showing how, how top level football can really be. But yeah, thank you again, Dad, for a great conversation. And for everyone listening, I'll see you again next week. This is McLaren Performance.